Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay, and uh, thanks for joining us. Um, just let you know right off the top that the webinar is being recorded. Um, so just uh, be aware of that. And uh, we'll be starting in just a minute or so. So feel free to say hi in the chat and uh, where you're joining in from. Alrighty, so it's uh, one o'clock. Might let a couple more people trickle in, but we seem to have a pretty good group uh, so far. Hi, Kathy. Uh, Chris is at the Toronto Zoo. Hi, Ruth. Awesome, yeah, it looks like we have a really great group here. Hi from Oxbridge. Hi, Joanne. All right, well, uh, without further ado, because it is one o'clock and I want to respect everyone's time, so uh, we'll get started. Um, and my name is Aidan uh, O'Brien. I'm um, the Land Securement Coordinator with the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust, um, and I'll be kind of moderating the event. So um, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. And um, while I'm doing the land acknowledgement, I know you've probably heard quite a few in the past, but um, just deeply reflect on kind of the words that I'm saying and um, why the land acknowledgement itself is important and, and the role that um, we play as naturalists and as a land trust um, in reconciliation. So um, we would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. Uh, and we would also like to acknowledge the land we are on as a meeting place of two treaties, uh, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. So we would like to thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. And we would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of the Georgina Island First Nation as our closest Indigenous community. Uh, we acknowledge this land and the people because the first step to reconciliation is recognizing the existence of Indigenous people and a shared um, understanding uh, of our collective past brought us to where we are today and will help us walk together into a better future. So we give deep gratitude to the Indigenous peoples of these lands who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. And the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Trust uh, endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce uh, our very own Aileen Barkley, who will be giving the chat today on uh, trees and their health. So um, thank you so much for joining. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll save them towards the end and uh, we'll field some then. Take it away, Aileen. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, everybody from the zoo. <laughs> I feel like I should crack some zoo joke, but uh, I don't have one. <laughs> So thanks for uh, joining us today. It's a lovely sunny day out and it's a bit tough to be inside, but uh, hopefully this will inspire you to get out and, and enjoy nature and plant some trees or at least learn and, and ID some trees and admire them. So uh, a little bit about the Oak Ridges Moraine. Actually, I have to stop the timings. Um, I just realized that uh, <laughs> it's going to start forwarding on me. So I'm going to close those off. Stay with me for a second. Where are the rest of them? I think I got them all off. Okay, let's try this again. So um, I am with the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust. Um, I am the project manager and I help with the stewardship, monitoring and pretty much everything else <laughs> with, the, with the organization. 
Um, I'm going to start just let you know a little bit about us. So right now we have protected 60 different properties um, and that is 4,480 acres and we're adding another 400 more. Um, the Oak Ridges Moraine is, is quite large. So we're, uh, we're working on a very broad geographic area. Um, but when we protect stuff, it stays protected forever. So it doesn't get sold to developers or, um, you know, divided up or, or whatnot. It stays protected forever. And that's backed up with help from the federal government. And we don't do the legislation on the Oak Ridges Moraine. We get a lot of calls. I would like to build a house. Can I do that? Uh, we are a charity, a registered charity. And so we protect land based on donations and sometimes purchases. But we have nothing to do with the legislation of the Oak Ridges Moraine. Um, so if you don't know anything about the Oak Ridges Moraine, it's located within the Green Belt. Uh, it is an environmentally sensitive geological landform, and it stretches from the Niagara Escarpment straight across to the Trent River um, and kind of a little bit beyond, so Rice Lake area. Um, tons of really cool habitat on there, but it was in a lot of jeopardy. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Back in 99, the big fight to save the moraine because there was no continuous green space. They wanted to develop uh, up the Richmond Hill corridor and block it off. And that's how we got our origins here is to um, help save land uh, permanently so it couldn't be, you know, expropriated for highways or for whatever development. Um, it's a rain barrel, so all the water lands on it and it feeds all the different lakes. And I'll talk about which ones different, or which rivers, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, the way I describe this, when I'm trying to explain it to kids, and I, I find it works great for adults too, is that um, when you have that big pile of snow, and I hate to say the S word when we're getting into that, uh, that time of year, you have a big pile of snow that melts in the spring. And it leaves kind of a, a bunch of rocks and, and sand and stuff along the edge of your driveway. That's kind of like what happened with the moraine, except it was between some glacial lobes. So instead of a pile of snow that's maybe two or three feet high, this was about uh, several kilometers. So it's a much bigger scale, but it's similar. So we have a lot of um, sand and uh, rocks along, and that's what makes up the moraine. So there we go. We have species at risk. There's a map. Um, this isn't all of our, our um, properties because we haven't updated this, but it just goes to show you kind of all the, the areas that we're protecting. Um, over in Northumberland, we're starting a new exciting pro, uh, property. I was out there on Friday doing some surveys on a really cool property with Carolinian species of trees, trees I'd never even heard of before. It was amazing. Um, Kentucky coffee tree, tulip tree, Ohio buckeye, um, uh, yellowwood, uh, sycamore. It was amazing. I was just below the 401. It was a phenomenal uh, place to visit. So when we protect land forever, we typically do that through the Ecological Gifts Program, which is an incredible tax incentive. It's one of the best you can get. Um, and it stays protected for forever, which in legal terms is 999 years. <laughs> um, it's a great way for people to protect the land. So the protection stays with their property in a conservation easement scenario, and they can sell it or if they, they pass on and they're you know, not worried of, or they're, they are worried about what their children might do, that protection stays on the property. Um, and we go and monitor and make sure that, you know, that the nature is being protected year after year. Um, and in doing that, there is tax benefits to kind of honor the fact that you are donating, if you will, um, some valuable land for permanent protection, because that's a value to everybody. And it's, it's a great one. Um, I think you can use it over a 10 year period versus a two year period with most charitable receipts. So it's um, a lot of our recommendations come from accountants. <laughs> So it's a good one. Um, and, you know, the environmental, it's, it's conserved for forever. Um, we do get full donations of land, which are nature reserves. They're generally not open to the public. They are protected for nature first. So there are trails and um, our priority for that is to give nature a place, safe place to stay with um, as little human involvement as possible. Because sometimes we can mess stuff up. <laughs> So what we're going to look today, that was just a brief look at uh, kind of the moraine, but a bit more of the, um, the trust and what we do. We're going to look at why trees are awesome, why native trees are awesome, er, <laughs> that's such a word, uh, which trees would be awesome in your yard, some design ideas and tips, and how to look after your trees.
So um, just to, I'm not going to read through all this, but this is just a whole lot of stuff on how cool the moraine is. It feeds 64 different rivers and uh, rivers and streams. So everything north of the moraine goes to um, Simcoe generally in, in this area of York, and then everything south goes down to Lake Ontario right across the moraine. 90% uh, of it's in private ownership, so that makes it somewhat vulnerable. Um, the Oak Ridge's Marine Conservation Plan is legislation in place. However, legislation is never permanent, and we saw it being threatened not that long ago. So uh, the way we do it, it's, we say we're protection beyond legislation, which is pretty cool to be able to be part of. Um, however, a big chunk of it is in the GTA, which has the highest land rates <laughs> in the country and also the highest like high development rates um, and high impact rates so it's it's um some land trusts have much bigger numbers associated with what they're saving but um where we are every little bit counts because we're so threatened by all the development and population expansion all right so why are trees awesome um, I'm pretty sure you guys because you're already here watching the webinar that I don't really have to work too hard to convince you on that so um, they provide shade and wind breaks. So that can have a really nice impact on your heating and cooling bills. Um, you know, if you face south and it's full sun and it's summer, it's hot. Uh, if you get a north wind, and I have both of those, <laughs> I face south on one and north on the other. So I experience both of those. Um, uh, you know, wind can really help to break up those, those impacts at the uh, summer and winter. Um, heavy rain. So if you're ever in the forest, a nice big deciduous forest with lots of leaves and it rains, uh, it takes about 10 minutes before you actually start to get wet under the trees. So it does break up rain and allows it to kind of, uh, you know, trickle down. And, you know, the rain stops and it's still dripping off the leaves an hour or two, three later. So it's a good way to diffuse, especially now that we're seeing those heavy, crazy storm events. Um, I had hail that just destroyed my garden this year. I've never had it like that. It's crazy. Uh, obviously, they improve our air. They, you know, take carbon dioxide, put out oxygen, and they clean our water, their roots, their absorption. Um, they help improve soil structure and biology. And if you haven't read about, uh, I think, what's it called? The Tr Secret Lives of Trees or, or that book. It, um, it talks about how trees talk to each other through fungal relationships. And it's pretty awesome. Trees look out after each other because when they're in a forest situation, it benefits everybody if everybody else stays um, healthy. It's kind of like safety numbers, if you will. And so they, they've developed over time this really cool biology and relationship with fungi to help absorb their nutrients. Um, and in turn, the fungi need the trees because they can't photosynthesize. So they kind of have a cooperative relationship, but they can talk to other trees send chemical signals through the fungal relationships. And um, if one tree needs help, another tree that's usually what they call the mother tree or the strongest tree can actually send nutrients back out through her roots through this fungal network to support the uh, struggling trees. If there's an insect attack, they can send a warning so the other trees can change, you know, what they're absorbing out of the, the soil with help of the fungi to be able to defend against, you know, the aphids or, or what, whatnot. So really cool um, relationship there. And so soil structure and biology is really good. And the more mature a forest is, the more mature that kind of um, fungal soil community is, I guess we'll call it, um, group of friends. Uh, habitat and biodiversity. Uh, I think oak trees, I, I can't remember the exact number, but they provide um, direct benefit to over 800 different species. That's pretty impressive. So they are integral to that many species in their life cycle. Um, they increase real estate values. Uh, my street, when I moved in about nine years ago, was lined with these trees that they were just getting to that beautiful stage where they almost touched in the, in the, the street, but they were all ash. And so the emerald ash borer has taken out a lot of them and it's really changed from a beautiful, um, wow, what a great, neighborhood to move to to oh man some of these houses are really ugly behind these trees um but they do have a nice real estate value they add almost uh, ambiance and just um, a mature well-designed landscape they're now saying i think it was tv did a, a report a couple years ago that kitchens 
and bathrooms used to be what you invested in for your house for, for best return on investment. But the styles and the DIY stuff has accelerated it. So kitchens and bathrooms are only staying modern for about five years, five to 10 years, where a landscape gets better as it grows. And so there, that's becoming the more um, valued and longer term investment for your, your property. Um, they diffuse urban noises. So that property I was at on Friday was really, really close to the 401 and there's times you could barely hear it, which is pretty impressive. Um, better physical and mental health. So there's studies that show that say um, children that study with the view of nature, so non grass, non um, built environment do better on test scores. That looking out onto a tree or again, a non linear um, type environment it boosts the, the positive chemicals going to your frontal lobe. There's a whole book uh, by Richard Louv called Your Brain on it's Your Brain on Nature, and there's an AG, uh, the Nature Deficit Disorder. It's the really fascinating stuff. Um, they show that neighborhoods with mature trees have less crime. That's that's a pretty cool uh, effect from a tree, and it's also a way to leave your legacy. So there's an old uh, proverb, and I, I see it used in different terms, but uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, it, you know, there's always variants, but uh, little trees don't look like much, but the right tree in the right place, it, it's your legacy. I planted that and hopefully it'll stay forever uh, and they provide home for owls. And here's a cute little owl I saw up in the sugar maple. Who doesn't love owls? They're awesome. All right, um, so why native trees? Why are they awesomer? Again, their habitat. So all of our native species have evolved um, and they have this really cool interconnection and they all rely on each other. So if you suddenly take out something and put something else in, it's trying to like, almost like trying to match a Lego piece with one of those big mega blocks. It just, they just don't, they don't fit together. Um, moss, this is my new obsession. <laughs> They're butterflies of the night. And there are so there was over 3,000 different types of moss in Ontario. I used to be terrified of moss. You'd go outside and they'd randomly fly at you and I'd be swatting and screaming. And then I stopped and actually started looking at them and, and looking at the diversity. And they are incredible. Because when you look, they're not just white, scary flying things. They are gold colored and pink and green and um, just incredible diversity and a lot of people panic when they see like a caterpillar that they don't recognize and it's save the butterflies but kill everything else moss are really important um, they feed a lot of our um, uh, insectivorous animals um, especially birds and the night flying birds like the common night hawk and the whippoorwill which are both uh, threatened and i think the whippoorwill is now endangered they're both species at risk and they they depend on that um, so they're really important and the, the caterpillars, one chickadee will eat nine caterpillars a day when they've got young. So if you have a balance, they don't have to worry about them eating your uh, leaves. And if they're eating your leaves, just be thankful that you're helping to feed a, a species at risk or at least a cute little chickadee. Uh, nature responds when you, when you use native plants. If you build it, they will come. The first year I, I, uh, I just graduated and I started, I was starting in the business and I went to my first native plant sale and I saved up my money and I spent $200. And that was a lot of money back then for a graduate <laughs> for starting out in the business, getting really bad minimum wage. <laughs> um, and I was so happy and I planted it in the back garden. And then uh, for the first time ever, that was my dad's garden and I took it over when he passed away. Uh, a, a little groundhog came in and it only ate my native plants. I was so devastated. They all came back and they came back so robust and strong. I thought it was awesome. So um, that's really cool. And then later on, I had the giant sunflower, uh, Helianthus gigant gigantica. Um, and I looked and I thought it had broken and fallen over. So I whipped open the screen door and all the birds flew off of it and it bounced right back up. <laughs> it was weighted down with so many birds feeding on the seeds. Um, it was pretty, so I was sold at that point, let's just say. Um, they're adapted to local conditions. Now there's a few, because of climate change and because of where we are along the moraine, we're kind of in that difference between, um, if you're a gardener, zone five and zone six. Um, if you're into more ecology, it's that Carolinian zone and then up into um, the zone I'm in, which I'm forgetting, <laughs> the one north of the Carolinian. 
And so as climate change increases, it's pushing that line up. And some plants like white spruce may not adapt as well to that warmer period. So things might change, but generally they're, they're fairly well adapted. Um, and from a, a home perspective, they're the architect's architecture of your garden. And I'll explain my house scenario. Here's just some cool moss to show you how neat they are, the different colors and shapes, and it doesn't even capture the glimmer or shiny stuff they have. Uh, we did a moth night at one of our nature reserves this July, and in one night we had 205 different species of moths. It was really cool. Um, so every native tree provides a value. They support biodiversity. They have probably way more than a value, lots of values. Um, some are better for your backyards than others. So not every native tree as great as they are. Not everyone should be in your backyard. Um, some of them have better places to be. So you can just see here, you've got some little screech owls. Remember I said they house uh, owls. These are little baby owls that I looked at. They were staring at me in the, in the middle of the day. It was so cute. Um, so this is what you're helping to provide habitat for. So here's some ones that we're going to talk about that um, I think are really nice and they will work with your backyard. This is service berry. There's a few different types of service berry. This is just one, the latest um, or smooth service berry. This one is it's actually becoming a bit overused because it's so awesome that every design seems to have a service berry in it because it, it's got all four seasons of interest. When it gets mature, it's got a really nice multi-stemmed, gray, smooth bark structure. Um, it's got berries, the birds love it. It's got flowers. And right now, if I look back at my one, uh, when it turns in the fall, this time of year, it turns a beautiful, bright uh, orange, almost like a peachy orange tree. So it's just, it's interesting all years. I will tell you that rabbits really do like it because my lovely mature one is down to one stalk because rabbits ate the other two so protect it <laughs> um i've never had a rabbit issue until two years ago and man did they ever do damage um id iding between the different service berries i still i still i'm just like it's a service berry and someone who knows better can do it um, or i read the, the tag if i'm at the garden center or, or doing a plant um generally they're about 10 meters in height so it's a shrub but it's kind of like a multi-stemmed little tree and then a lot of the smaller backyards like mine that's what we need I, I i would love to have a giant oak but it would take up the entire backyard so um these are kind of mini trees even though they're shrubs um, which is another great reason for it and they have alternate leaves serrated edges these are all kind of the id uh, features i'm not going to go through them one at one uh, one by one we will have this reported afterwards and i think i might be able if we have your emails i could probably send out um, a copy of this um the, the multi stem smooth gray and then they have like even though there's a, a slight serrated edge to the leaves they look very soft um and they're they're lighter above or sorry dark green above and lighter underneath um when you start to notice what a service berry looks like, it just stands out. And so here's some examples of the more mature ones. And you can see that the multi-stem, um, this one here, it's at court right. And it's, it's surrounded by this little gazebo and it just undoes the beauty of this tree with this awful background, but that's where it is. Um, and they have weddings there and uh, before COVID and everyone wanted to pose by that tree all season long whenever i was there um, someone wanted to pose by it's just stunning and that's it in bloom on the top um, and then the lower picture is it um, in a front garden um, not in bloom just in the summer but it still has really cool architecture so because the, the summer is probably when it hasn't the berries aren't out yet and the flowers are done uh, that's when it's i guess the most boring version of it itself um, so that's when you want to have flowering trees or flowering perennials or native plants nearby. You want to time that. Um, and then that offsets. So even though the tree is doing something completely fabulous at that little period of time, something that down below is. And that's a great way to kind of balance that uh, bloom time in your garden. And of course, underneath, it's really good if you plant with native plants there too. And they're becoming really trendy. I think last year, everyone wanted to do something in their garden there wasn't much else to do you could not find native plants there was waiting lists even this year 
um, which is good because that kind of demand means more will become available and they'll start replacing some of those other invasives. So if you have shade, um, this one is a great, again, one of those mini, it's a shrub, but it's more of a mini tree for the little backyards. Um, and it is very shade tolerant. It is pagoda or alternate leaf dogwood, and it tends to grow um, in sugar maple type forests. So very heavy shade. And it competes down in its little bit of sunshine down at the base of oaks and, and sugar maples. Um, another four seasons of interest with a really neat little architecture to it, which is how it got its name pagoda. It looks like a pagoda house or structure. Um, again, it's it's got the flowers. And I mean, I, I think it was last year, everyone I saw had so many flowers on it. Just little, these little white kind of flattened bundles of flowers all over it. And then you can see how many berries there are in the top picture. It's it's fabulous. I say that I obviously love trees because I'll say that about all of them. But these are my favorites. Um, it's got a, a neat leaf structure, um, very kind of heavy vein. Um, again, four to six meters in height. I think it's maybe a bit higher if it's happy. But in the sun, it won't be as happy. I have yet. It's it's one of those things that is not photogenic. So even though it's great when you see it in person, I've yet to find a really good or take a good picture to really capture its beauty out in nature because it's usually in a darker area. Um, I've tried to here and you can kind of see on the lower picture the different structures of the, the branches. Um, so how do you use it for design features? Uh, more sun is more branches, so you're not going to kind of get that really neat branched architecture you will in heavy sun, but it's still great. Uh, again, the same with service berry is that it's got that little gap between flowering and berries when they've actually ripened, um, which is, I think, about mid-June to July, um, where you want to maybe have something nearby to catch it. But it's got these really neat, deep vein, dark green leaves that kind of hold its own. So it's not necessarily. Um, it's great for layering. So if you have a bigger property, um, layering is good. So the way I use my, my home analogy is when you're looking at your garden, you want to look at the trees are your walls of your house. The shrubs are your furniture and the um, flowers, native plants and all that, they're your decorations, your pillows, your artwork, your lanterns, lamps or whatever. So when you look at that, you have to think that if you had walls and pillows, it might look a little funny. Um, if you had just furniture and pillows and no walls, it might be funny. Um, if you just had, you know, uh, trees and shrubs and no pillows or, or anything like that, it might look a bit off. So try and think of that balance. And if you have so many pillows and, and, and decorations and stuff all over the place, it gets cluttered and it looks a little busy. So if you can kind of approach your garden like that, so you want your, your main foundation, your um, shrubs, which are your, your furniture, and then just some subtle but notable accents around. It's a really good way to approach it. Hopefully that helps you guys a bit. And layering is part of that. Um, having a big tall tree and then nothing, and then a low growing flower just looks a bit off. Everyone has their own opinions and their own interests though. So some of you might like that look. And that's okay. Okay, white cedar. Um, there is the, the standard white cedar that you see growing out in the wild, and then there's a few cultivars. So this is the one in my backyard that I inherited. Um, right now it's about 10 feet taller than that picture. <laughs> and that's one, I can't remember the name of it, but it's got like a gold tinge on it. Uh, there's your emerald ones, which are the, the kind of narrow, um, tall ones that you see quite often. And then they have the hedge cedars, which tend to be more of the native ones. You have globe cedars and, and all that. Um, they all serve their purpose. Um, they can grow quite big, 12 to 20 meters in height, unless it's a little um, globe cedar and it's much, much smaller. Obviously your winter interest, it's green all year. And I tell you that one in my backyard is like, birdie heaven because my neighbor feeds the birds and then they come when it gets cold and they hide in my cedar and then they go back and forth so i never know how many birds are back there um they don't breed mosquitoes i have seen people oh i have to cut the cedars down because mosquitoes breed in them no they don't mosquitoes breed in water standing water cedars tend to tolerate wet areas so people go into swampy wet areas 
there's mosquitoes because it's standing water and they go, oh, they must breed in the trees. They don't breed in trees. So that is just, it's such a, a misnomer and, and not right at all. Um, mosquitoes will hide in any vegetation. So if you walk through any kind of vegetation, you might disturb them. Um, long grass, oh, they're terrible. Or just take me with you because they love me. So if I'm around, they'll all be on me and they'll leave you guys alone. <laughs> um, native is always best. The, the closer to native you can get and, and anything closer to the, the original species, usually like 90% of the time, it's the better variety. Sometimes they'll tinker with some of the cultivars and maybe if they're exposed to um, like powdery mildew, they'll, they'll breed it out, but it's still not gonna be the original core that all the birds and bees and moths and all the cool stuff have adapted to. And that's just a little pine siskin on the lower, um, in the photo eating the little um, seeds from the cedar tree. Uh, I think everyone's pretty good at recognizing cedar. If you're not sure, you can just squish the leaves and smell it. Um, but it's got a very flat evergreen. Um, as I said, multiple different varieties. Um, the bark tends to be like a, um, almost like a shredded reddish brown um, and the more mature they get, the more that shredding shows up. Um, they can be single or multi-stemmed. And then of course, all the different shapes and sizes. The closest thing that you might confuse these for is uh, juniper. Um, and they tend to be not quite as flat and they're more, um, if you just rub the leaves, <laughs> hopefully you're not like me and you react to it, um, they're, they're more prickly. So design ideas and placement for cedars. I mean, they're very, very versatile. Up at the top, you can see those emerald cedars and that's, that's a hedge, but it's not your typical kind of cut boxy hedge. Um, they can block unwanted views year round. Um, they can be a backdrop to something you wanna highlight, like if, I don't know, maybe you're into peonies or something uh, or, or whatever, or behind uh, a feature, a beautiful sculpture or something in your garden. Um, if you want a more formal look, so my backyard tends to be more natural look. I just, I love plants, so I stick stuff wherever I find room. Um, but if you use a repeated thing, a uh, repeated plant in a line, that creates a more formal look if you're into that. Um, and as I said, you know, we all wear different styles of clothes and all of our garden tastes are different too. So teach their own. I like all of it. <laughs> I need much bigger space and a few more gardens. So uh, the next one is white paper birch. This one is just the one whenever, it's, it's a bit campy, but whenever I see it lit up, the way the right light on a good white birch, just, oh, just I find it so dramatic. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, these are, now you're getting into the big trees. And again, with that white uh, bark, they have um, all seasons of interest. They really kind of shine in the winter time. It's another white, vertical white surface from all the other white. Uh, it's a shoreline tree up north. You probably recognize that. Pollen, oh my gosh, if you've ever been up north or anywhere near water and it's in bloom and um, it's, there's like a yellow film on the, on the lake and that's usually birch. Don't peel the bark. Everybody likes to do it, but it does start to expose it to disease. So um, leave, the, leave the bark alone unless you're stuck and you need something to start fire to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> just leave it alone. Um, there is um, a disease that affects them. So if you're noticing you have a white and there's a big beautiful one in the field behind me and um, or school yard I guess it is and it's been dying over the years and I'm looking at it right now and I'm like oh it's even worse. If you start to see it top down um, you definitely want to get someone in and protect your investment and look after it. Uh, it needs to be specially treated. It's worth it. So uh, the ID features, everyone seems to know the white birch. Uh, the closest thing that you might confuse it with is the poplar trees and or uh, yellow birch. Yellow birch looks like a dirty version of um, this. It's a very dark stained, almost like tea stained type of um, bark. And then the poplar won't have as many lines and it's much smoother. It doesn't paper off or, or start to peel like the white, white uh, birch does. The leaves are great. I love this kind of alternate branch with the, the deep groove leaves and the tooth, the teeth in the end. Um, I think they just, I don't know, my kind of leaf, I guess. Um, they do have a catkins, which is kind of, if you don't know what a catkin is, you're probably familiar with a, a pussy willow. The pussy's on them, little fuzzy things. That's a catkin. That one's just really fuzzy. Um, they tend to be kind of long hanging um, versions of that and they don't have the fuzz on them. And because of that, they're pollinated by wind 
and that's why my allergies are bad. <laughs> but I don't love them any less for it. They're allowed to do that. So design ideas for this, it can be um, a real centerpiece, a nice mature white birch, like the picture uh, down below. Um, it it kind of holds its own. Um, lighting to accent the bark, and I put watch how much. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have fireflies, in the month of June and July, having lights kind of messes with them. So uh, don't over light up your backyard. I love night lighting, but if when you're not out there, turn it off. And if you don't need it in June and July, and you're near an area where you know you have fireflies, um, you know, turn them off. It, it really does make a difference just for that little period of time. And they can really light up a dark area. Okay. Tulip tree, this one is nice. Uh, beautiful shape on it. As you can see in this picture down below and the people enjoying the shade, um, it's a big one uh, and it takes a while. The blooms, and I'll show you on the next picture, they're pretty cool and this is why everybody wants it, but it takes 15 to 20 years for them and it's very fast living, but it's, it's a pretty cool one. Uh, they're now being used, this used to be, a, or it's still considered a Carolinian species, which is basically the 401 in South um and and then southwest obviously but they're planting them more and more and i'm seeing mature tulip trees thriving in areas north of newmarket which is where i am um so i don't know if they're just if it's climate change or they're just a little hardier i don't know but they seem to be doing okay unfortunately redbud which is an incredible shrub uh is not thriving like these guys up here um so that's the leaf. It's a very distinct leaf. Uh, it's like a maple leaf, but missing a lobe or it's got an extra lobe and missing some little um, other grooves out of it. And there's the bloom. So I just wanna make sure, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat little tulip. It looks like a tulip. Um, and it's this nice peachy yellowy color. You need to give it room. Don't plant it too close to your house. Don't plant it anywhere near your house. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in mistakes. Um, and I don't know why I have it away from a house and sitting area. I'm trying to think, I guess just when the petals, it can get a bit drippy, I think. Like, it's kind of like honey locusts, they drip a bit, but just don't want it too near your house. Okay, white pine. Now, now we're getting into the big trees. Um, this is Ontario's arbor arboreal emblem. So it's Ontario's awesome tree, basically. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of characterized with a group of seven and, and they stand tall if you're up north and there's always that one big giant canopy tree. Um, they're amazing, but remember that's how big they get. They can grow um, 100, 200 feet in height and they grow dead straight, which is why so many of them were taken out because they made great masts for the ships, for the British Navy. So um, we lost hundreds of thousands of our really, you know, one to 200 year old mature pine trees. And so they're not as common on the um, landscape as they once were, but they are coming back. It's just taking them a bit longer. So how you identify them, because there's a few different pine trees is that they have five needles. So how everyone remembers is it's white pine and white is five letters and there are five needles. Um, everything else has basically two in this area. And dark bark, um, when they leak, they tend to leak a white um, sap, which is how they got their name. Okay, so here's a little comparison, and I'm going to do a test. So there are two pine trees in this picture, and this is actually at the office in the driveway. And I want to know if anyone out there can tell which tree. There's two different types of pine trees. If just by looking at them, you can tell which one on the right and left is what pine. I'll give you a hint. One of them is white pine. Let's see. Ooh, Latvia. See what everyone thinks. Left is white pine from Roberta. Red. Which side is red, Rob? Yeah. Oh, we got everyone. We've got, I think we're about 50 50. <laughs> okay. So the left side, um, that is red pine. 
So you can kind of see that the, the white pine looks a bit more fluffier and fuller. Um, red pine, they have longer needles. They're in groups of two. And when, if you could see the bark close enough, you can see they have like a pinkish reddish tinge to it. To it. So the, um, they just, they, because of the long needles, they don't look as soft. So when you're looking at the two, you can kind of see on the right that the white pines are softer. Um, that's a bit of a trick question because it's, I, <laughs> I know them because I stare at them inside the window. Um, but this is just to show you, they get really big. So they need a lot of space. Um, if you have a, a really nice big garden, you know, one of the ones built in the, basically from the 50s to the 70s, and you have a nice garden or you have a, a, a property, of, you know, a couple acres, oh, white pines are the way to go. They're amazing. Um, oh, thanks, Aiden. All right. And they do like well-drained soils. Um, they were the ones, so when the moraine was cleared, because of all that sandy soil, we got blow sands. And so when they cleared all the topsoil and ripped out all the native trees, uh, it got really bad. The, like just sand everywhere. You couldn't leave your house on some days. Roads would get blocked. Um, and so planting in sand, there's not a lot that will likes to grow in full sun sand. So white pine was one of them, as well as red pine, which is why it's been used extensively across the marine, because it really thrives in, in full sun. It's not native to this area. It's native to more of the um, uh, shield but it, it was able to kind of grow, didn't reproduce very well, but it grew and, and made the conditions nice for all the other stuff to come back like oaks and maples and, and more pine. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. Okay, sugar maple. Uh, right now, these guys are just like, hey, look at me, I am fabulous. It's that time of year for them to shine. Uh, another really big tree, and it's a hardwood, so they tend to grow um, a lot slower. Then say a silver maple, which is more of a soft wood. They grow faster, but they're not, um, the wood isn't as dense. So generally the faster a tree grows, the shorter lived and the less um, strong it is, I guess you could say. And the slower it grows like ironwood, which grows quite slow, is very strong and dense wood, generally. Um, they, they can take a bit more, they will grow in sun, but they, in the wild, they kind of prefer a bit more of a shady semi, successional type of, uh, of situation and they provide maple syrup so that's pretty awesome. So how do you tell the difference? There's many maples out there and this is just a few that are, are typical around here. Um, it is the iconic maple leaf however and pennies aren't in circulation anymore but if you look at the penny um, if you have one saved around somewhere the leaf is a sugar maple, but if you look at the branch arrangement, it's actually a sycamore. He was looking at a sycamore tree when he, when he um, did the design. So maples and ash always have opposite branch arrangements. So if you think of my body as the main stem, their branches are my arms right across from each other, where the opposite, or sorry, alternate leaf arrangement would be my left arm and my right leg. So they're not, they're kind of staggered. Hopefully that makes sense. So. Um, yeah, that's a little thing, but the the, uh, the penny is that you, you you can tell by their uh, branch arrangement, it's uh, alternate, not opposite. So red maple, and this isn't the red maple that is the Norway maple. It's not the one that looks red or the crimson red. This is our actual native red. Um, I say it looks like a fat sugar maple leaf. And sugar, silver maple looks like a skinny maple leaf. And a Norway maple, that one looks almost exactly the same. The easy trick until the leaves fall off is that you take off a leaf. If it's red, like the one I'm showing here, it's kind of obvious, but uh, if it's green and you break off where the stem meets the leaf and you can see there's a white milky substance. And if it comes out white, milky and white, that's a Norway maple. We don't like those. If it's clear, it's a sugar maple. So that's probably one of the easiest ways to uh, tell apart. Okay, so that's, yeah, we're gonna look at identification features. Where are we? Oh, sorry, we're still on these. <laughs> Jumped, I'm hitting the things too fast. So it's not a maple, but it was an example I could, could use to show you what to do with a maple. So again, you need a bit of space because it will get quite large. Um, it, it's a centerpiece if you have not such a big garden, if you don't have like an acre or huge backyard, um, but it can be a real centerpiece. And remember, green is a color. So I love this because people say, I need color, I need color. Green can be a very calming and cool 
color. So if you have um, a garden with mostly green and maybe just a few colors or maybe just all different shades of green, it really can look amazing. You don't have to worry about flowering times and all this. Green with different texture can really create a cool, calm garden feel. And so that's just an example of, of kind of that with a larger lollipop shaped tree like a sugar maple that you can have that as a centerpiece for that garden. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, red oak. So now we're into like the big, big guys. These are pretty cool. These are the ones that, you know, when you're driving by and you see this awesome, huge, massive tree, it just stands out and says, hey, I'm an oak. Yeah, it's awesome. It's the ones in the farmer fields. The farmer fields just left them and sometimes they bury their old pets underneath. So be careful digging around them. Um, but they are just majestic, long living, phenomenal trees. If you live in Aurora, they're um, in the Arboretum. As you head north of the uh, baseball diamonds, uh, there is an oak there on the left side if you're heading north, so the west side that every time I see it I just go oh, it's amazing it's it's yeah they're when they're mature they really really stand out um, as I mentioned that they oaks support more than 800 different species they're they're the probably one of the more significant trees that we have um, you know, the squirrels, I love squirrels because they'll, they'll go up and instead of carrying acorns up and down, they'll snip off the tips and drop the whole cluster of them down and then do that a bunch. And if you're underneath, you sometimes get hit with them and then they'll come down and then they'll cache them all. And squirrels are really important. People get upset. They're biting off the tips. They're going to hurt my trees. No, they won't. Um, the trees and the squirrels have evolved together. They depend on each other. They work well together. People will trap and, and kill or remove squirrels because they're chewing off the tips of their, their silver maples or the ropes. They are essential because when they hide their, their oaks and their seeds and all that, they forget a lot of them. And so that's how the, the, the oaks and other nut trees are dependent on squirrels for getting their seeds spread and buried. Um, so it's a very symbiotic relationship, if you will. So don't worry if they're tip, uh, chewing off your tips. It's actually a really neat thing to watch how they effective they are in gathering it. Um, great nesting cavities. They're just a really neat tree, but my gosh, are they big. So they may be just as tall as some of the other trees, but they grow wide, um, 12 to 18 meters wide. And you can see in the lower picture uh, how amazing it is. Um, they are alternate branches again, so different um, from the maples. The leaves are pretty distinct. The pointed ones are easy. The pointed ones are red. Um, the ones that are more rounded on the edge, they can be Baroque, and that's mostly what they are around here. If you're in a swampy area or a planted area, they might be white swamp. When you go down into the Carolinian, it, I don't even know where to start with you. There's so many different oaks, um, and they're all so much similar. But around here, it's pretty straightforward. It's usually a Baroque, a red oak, sometimes it's a white oak. Uh, but red oak are the, definitely the more, more common ones. Um, so for placement, I don't know if you guys ever saw this, check out this tree, uh, in this picture, this was in this star and there, the tree, this is an oak. It is so, I think it was a couple hundred years old. They were thinking about taking out <laughs> the city was taking out the house to protect the tree because it was that amazing. Um, and it was starting to crowd out and then one of them had to go. So, um, really think about your placement and when you get information or the tag pay attention to that mature size you may not live to see this but somebody will so you don't want to see your legacy cut down because it was put in the wrong spot so if you put it in the right spot and you really think about its mature size and what impact impact it might have to neighboring structures or, or uses or whatever um, if you have it in the right plant the right place it could be your legacy for hundreds of years with the right plant right plant or tree okay um so uh, I'll just quickly look at the chat. Are there any questions? Yes, white pines. Um, I'm starting to see that. And I, there's a white pine, is it weevil? I think it is, that's affecting a, a plantation on one of our properties. Um, white spruce are being hit more, I think, from that than white pine. That's what I'm hearing more and that's what I'm seeing more. Um, white pine could, but I'm not hearing it as much as the spruce. 
Um, what was interesting is that the LDD moth um, that hit the area, and it was, I think, one of the worst outbreaks in ever, maybe, um, they usually don't eat evergreens. They stick to deciduous. They ate evergreens. <laughs> so uh, they will come back. They'll just take a lot longer. Deciduous are used to losing their leaves every year. Uh, pines and other evergreens just lose a few leaves and come back. So they really looked rough in areas where they were hit with that moth. Um, but they're coming back. Um, I think quite a few of our species, and I think the evergreens will take it more, will be affected by climate change. Um, if it's not just the weather, like the, the too hot, too dry, um, it will be things like invasive species coming up. So unfortunately, we'll have to look. Um, the differences between oak species. So I, I don't even want to try to go into the, uh, the, the other oaks that are south of here. Um, there's, oh, Schumard oak and, and pin oak and, and oh, there's so many. I don't even know them all, honestly. Um, bur oak has rounded edges and red oak has pointed edges. The bur oak and the white oak, the white, it's, I'm sure there's a more technical term to explain it and white oak really aren't that common, but the white oak tend to have a more consistent shape in the lobe where a bur oak is a more kind of in and out, uneven shapes and dents of the lobes, if that makes sense. I wish I could find a picture. Maybe Aiden, if you can look one up, the difference between white oak and bur oak, but bur oak looks a little bit more kind of random in its, in its curves of the whole overall leaf. It's not as even as the red or the white, and it has rounded um, leaves. Hopefully that helps. And bur oak are, again, the most common ones around here. Let's see, that help? Okay, all right. So uh, general design tips to include when you're thinking about planting your new wonderful tree that I've just inspired you to do. Um, don't overcrowd. And I look out at my garden because that's what I do. <laughs> and then you have to make the decision of taking out the crowded stuff. And I, I cut down a, a shrub that came with the house years ago and I looked back out about 10 minutes later and this little song sparrow who's been living back there stood on one of the cut branches and looked around like, what, where'd my house go? So um, I'm glad he's gonna be heading south soon because I don't feel so guilty. But really, again, look at that mature size and, and plan for that. It might look a bit sparse for a bit, but it's uh, better long-term. Make it easy to look after. Um, don't, you know, don't have a favorite tree that might need a little extra planting and put it really, really far away so you're gonna forget about it and it's too hot to walk in the summer. Don't clean up for the winter, um, leave it. The leaf litter uh, is so, so, so important. There's things like fireflies and to, to uh, butterflies and moss and all these wonderful things live in that leaf litter and raking it up is just destroying it. Um, it's not gonna smother anything. I've seen tulips come through, grow up through hay bales. <laughs> things will go. Um, and if you have a big mature oak, and tons of leaves and it's on your lawn, you can try to mow it, but it's not gonna smother your grass. If it's really, really thick and you're really worried and you don't wanna mow it, which, you know, if you can leave it as is, it's best, you can kind of push them aside into your, uh, into your garden and add some extra in there. Um, have little vignettes of, of bloom interest. So instead of trying to time your garden so you have something all the time, is have maybe a spring where there's bloom or summer where there's bloom or, or just space that you don't have to have constant bloom. Green is a color. You just need one or two little showy pieces. You need too many. And again, it's like having too many pillows, okay? Remember that foliage is a feature. So the natives, they tend to be green, but you can get different shapes. So if you have say a maple tree and a white pine, you have different um, textures in those trees. And if you have that alternate leaf dogwood with that deep veining, um, and then you have, say, a cedar tree. Again, you're having different textures and different types of foliage. And that can add to a garden. Um, there are cultivars out there now with different colors and all that. Um, they're not going to be as great as the natives, but if, you're, if you want a little color to kind of spruce up your natives, pun intended, haha, <laughs> spruce, um, you can look for some of those. There's a nine bark, which is a native, and it's been cultivated to different colors, like purples and yellows and stuff like that. And it's easier because you get color in your garden without worrying about blooms. And I already talked about the living room scenario. 
Okay, again, foliage is a feature. Um, again, mature trees don't make the design, but you need them as part of it. So they're your walls, your, your um, doorways, things like that. Um, if you want a big punch and you have a larger space, uh, plant in groups of three or five for some of your, your plants underneath. Um, it just makes them look bigger. So you see those some places, my, um, my friend, I tell her what to plant and she'll plant it and it'll be amazing. And I have the same species in my backyard. It just doesn't thrive. She has the most incredible sandy loam soil. But if you're like me and you have clay soil and things just don't get amazing, um, you plant two or three and it looks like a big showy perennial when it's really three different yeah, ones combined. So that's a great way to add big impact. Um, here's some lovely, again, green on the left. This is from my friend, Sean James, um, who has been doing rain and native rain gardening and native gardening long before it became trendy. Um, he really knows his stuff. Um, so I borrowed these from him. So it's very natural spaces, natural trees. It, again, you look on the left, this looks so inviting and calm and it's all green, just different textures and shapes. So um, here's a great, this is, I mean, I got this about 20 years ago and it's been updated. This is Lorraine Menon's book and it's been the go-to forever. It's a hundred easy to grow native plants. It tells you what they look like, what to do with them, where to plant them. It's, it's a great reference guide. I think I have five copies because I would give them to some of my staff. <laughs> uh, depending where you live, you might want to check LEAF. Uh, it's yourleaf.org. Um, they have a lot of native plant kits available. But there's also a lot of great native plants uh, nurseries popping up and they used to be way out in the middle of nowhere. But with COVID, everybody's doing delivery now. They found the way to do it. So it might take a while, but you can get them delivered now. Um, I was at, uh, what was it called, Super Store this year, and they have a native, they're starting to bring in native plants and real native plants, not fake cultivar ones, and they're on sale, so I bought them all. Um, again, I'm running out of space, so um, they're becoming more and more available, and they really, they, they go together, if you're going to invest in a native tree, native shrub, native plants. Okay. So um, if you want shade, think about the dappled versus full. So at the top, you can see, and I, um, I can't remember if that's a Norway maple, you can see what the, the shade cast is full. And the one on the bottom is more of a dappled. Uh, something like a honey locust, they have those small leaves. And so they provide a bit more dappled shade, um, but they're called honey locusts for a reason. And they tend to have a period of time where they drip sticky stuff. So don't have that near your car or your house or your deck. Um, you can, if, if you're stuck and you have a Norway maple in your backyard, they cast such a heavy shade. They're, nothing grows underneath them, they're horrible. You can lollipop them. Um, if, depending how big they are, you might have to get an arborist in, but you can basically take off all the lower limbs. Um, and so that light can't come from above, but it can come in from the sides. And I, my, my second garden I owned was Norway maples. And we did that because we had all native plants growing in the back. And it, it did make a difference. But uh, think about the type of shade and, and what that mature tree is going to give you. How to know how much sun you have. And there are trees that thrive in full shade, but will grow in full sun. It's sometimes they just they just don't thrive. Other times they thrive where they shouldn't. Um, but with plants, if it dies, your investment's not such a big loss. But with a nice big tree, it might be more an investment. And you want to really honor where they're supposed to be. Full sun, six hours or more of direct sun. Part sun, three to six, part shade, two to four. So close, they tend to be used interchangeably, but there is a difference. And if you look at the little icons, they tend to have that on the, the plant tags or in the guides. Um, if it's the right side that the sun is, that means afternoon sun. And if it's the left side, that means morning sun. So that's what that means. And then pay attention to the difference. Full shade, nothing will go in full, full, full shade. It says zero to two. Um, you, they need some some sunlight at some point, dappled. The only thing that won't grow is something like a ghost pipe, which doesn't have photosynthesis. Um, but you wanna have that, it really should say one to two hours of direct sunlight or dappled sunlight. All right, looking after your investment. Uh, I'm just gonna check the chat. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, people think that I have to water every day. 
because I have to love my plant and that's what a good watering does. People kill more plants and trees with overwatering than underwatering. Um, in indoor plants, that's pretty much what kills most of the people's indoor plants is too much water. Um, they do need good water, but they don't need to be living in sopping wet water because when there's the soil saturated, there's no oxygen. Trees need oxygen just like we do in the roots. So uh, one to two week, two times a week for new trees. So if you have clay soil and it hasn't rained, you want to give it a good soaking around the drip line. Um, once a week, if you're in more sandy soil, then two times a week. If it's really, really hot and you're in clay soil and it's a newly planted tree, you might want to do it twice a week. Don't do it daily. <laughs> they don't need it. If you do a good deep soaking uh, once or twice a week, that's that's good if it hasn't rained. Um, mulching. Don't pile them up against. You want that uh, the base of the tree to not have anything against it. And when I moved in, the top, I have a little, I don't even know what it is. I think it's an amur maple cross no one's been able to tell me what it is yet foresters experts me uh, anyways um and the top of it was dying and sean came by my friend sean james and i said what's going on with this tree it's driving me nuts and he looks down and he goes oh it's buried too deep and he cleared out about an inch of soil from the base of the the stem and i've never had a problem since <laughs> so when you get your new tree where the soil line is that it comes from the nursery or wherever you get it from, um, respect that. Don't pile anything up, whether it's mulch or soil or whatever, and then check it. Because a few years after Sean told me that, um, I noticed it was dying again. And sure enough, it, I had been gardening and I pushed some stuff up against the, the, the um, base of the tree. So sometimes they can be that sensitive. Um, honor the drip line. And I don't know if everyone knows what the drip line is. But if it rains, it's the outermost that the drips from the trees are going to fall. So it's generally the kind of the width of the tree with the leaves, the, the width of the crown of the leaves of the tree. Um, under there tends to be where a lot of the roots are. They can go beyond, but don't park on the drip line of the tree uh, under the, the canopy of the tree because you're crushing the, the soil and, and pushing out all the oxygen and nutrients out of there. Um, don't dig too much under there. Um, just be really respectful of, of the area of the drip line of the tree. Uh, prune properly. I, you know, I had a dog and she passed away and it's, it's very sad, but I tell you, not having to walk around the neighborhood and seeing bad pruning or weeding that's not done, it's, it's kind of been a little bit of a blessing. I would, oh, can I just pull that one weed? Or I'd see bad pruning. So people would just cut and they would have this dead stump sticking out. And that just rots and it's, it's a gateway to disease or, or issues or whatever. Um, when you're pruning, look up how to prune properly. Sean's another one's got a great video. You want to prune to even to the next, um, either even to the stem or the branch. Don't leave little gaps. Um, or prune back to where there's a bud. You want to prune to something. I, I'm not explaining it very well, but uh, I will refer you to some great ones. Um, bye, Rob. Oh, awesome. Have fun in your, your forest. Say hi to it for me. Okay. Um, appreciate their value and respect the world. So, you know, love a tree. Some people, I don't like it. It's getting in the way and I just want to cut it down. And it's a hundred year old gorgeous sugar maple. Um, they, they bring a lot of value. So treat them nice. Uh, common mistakes, ignoring that height and width. Uh, putting it too close to structures. Remember when your branch goes up against your house, that means a raccoon or a squirrel can get onto your house and in your attic. So if you can keep them kind of away from your house and not hanging over top and uh, that'll be beneficial. Um, do it right, put the wrong, don't put the wrong plant in the wrong place. <laughs> don't do this to your trees <laughs> in this picture. Oh, this, every time I drive by it, it drives me nuts. And he somehow convinced all the neighbors to do it. And he's cleared all the neighbor's trees like this. I don't know what he did because it looks the most silliest looking tree, uh, street trees I've ever seen. Um, please don't do this. They have that skirt going down to the base for a reason. It protects the roots. So uh, a lot of people like to take the skirt off. Please don't do it. If you're going to plant a, a spruce, it, make sure that you have the skirt uh, included. Um, I think picture says a thousand words. Look at that root density on the right under mulch versus grass. Um, pretty impressive. I'd go for the one on the right for health. 
So mulch instead of grass around the base of the, or not around the base, but around the drip line is, is best. And LEAF, uh, they have a great program. They have a do-it-yourself or full service pro, um, program. They'll come out and they'll, they'll do consultations. They do book up quickly. You can also buy kits. They have pawpaws, but again, they sell really fast. Um, you just go to yourleaf.org. Some municipalities provide subsidized planting, which is great. And uh, yeah, and then we have other stuff coming up, which uh, Aiden covered at the beginning. We've got a talk on um, winter birding and uh, surviving winter with Michael Runtz, who's a phenomenal ecologist, naturalist. Um, he's talked about how animals survive winter. They're free. And uh, we also have some recorded ones on our website. We've got a tree planting. If you're interested and you're all motivated this Sunday, um, you can just email us and lots of other great stuff happening. So thank you very much. And yeah, there we go. So I will turn it over to Aiden and we'll see if we have any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Aileen. That was really, really informative. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, from Josette. Uh, can you provide the name of the videos you have referenced by Sean? Okay, so he has a, a pruning video. So um, you'd have to find Sean James Design and Consulting on YouTube and look up pruning. Um, he, he, he goes about pruning. He's taught me so much about pruning. It's amazing. Um, um, I, I, I had a quick question about pruning. Is there a good time of year to prune? Um, yeah, good question, yes. So depending on the trees, when they go into dormancy, so for deciduous trees, when they lose their leaves, um, that's probably a great time. If it's a flowering tree, uh, a shrub, sorry, I should say, they always say it's prune after bloom. So if it blooms early spring, it's over the next, um, like the summer and the fall, it sets its blooms for the following year. So something like forsythia, if you have one. If you prune later on, you're cutting off the blooms that it's set. So prune after it's bloomed for shrubs. And for trees, if they're um, uh, deciduous, you want them when the leaves are off. However, keep in mind if you're taking something out in the spring and you're pruning it, that the sap will start to run and it can leak out. And something like a Norway maple can leak a lot of sap, same with sugar. Um, so fall might be like late fall, uh, might be a better time to do that. And with evergreens, um, I guess spring is it's kind of any time, really. I would defer if it's a mature one. Usually, you're not pruning too much of evergreens, um, with the exception of cedars. Um, I would defer to an arborist if it's a really big, mature tree, um, just so you're not stressing it, because just to make sure they give it kind of an overall health check on it. Uh, and you don't want to ever take more than a third of the tree, except for Norway maples, because if they die, oh, oh well, <laughs> but they can take a little bit more pruning, but generally no more than a third. Um, and if it is a big tree and there's risk of, of injury or falling, you do want to get a professional with insurance and make sure they have insurance because I've seen people lie and take out houses. Um, That's a good point. That's uh, kind of leads to the next question. Penny said, um, our cedar trees on either side of our property have grown extremely tall. What should we do or do nothing? Um, I, I think I'd like to see a picture of that penny. Um, is it a hedge or is it a single tree? Cedars can be hedged, like, I mean, if you go to Disney World, you can see what you can do with them. Um, if they're, if it's a hedge or just a single tree, um, a, someone who really knows how to prune properly could probably do a good job. Um, I don't know if he's available, but Carl at Black Forest, if you ever go to Black Forest Garden Center, um, him and his dad are they're like the people you think are working at Disney. They, they are master pruners of cedar trees and shaping. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, but if you want to send me a picture, um, I'm at landtrust at oakridgesmoraine.org, or you can just reply to the email you got about the webinar today and uh, they'll forward it to me. All right. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks everybody. I think, I think that's the end of questions. I hopefully you guys all get inspired. Now is a great time to plant trees. Um, so planting and pruning is best done generally in uh, spring and fall. And fall with the weird weather that we're getting in spring, fall tends to be um, the more tolerable, more comfortable for the trees um, time of year now. So yeah, a little bit planting. safer. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, really great 
uh, turnout. Lots of thank yous. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, thank you, Kathy. So yeah, this will be, um, it's been recorded, so it'll be posted uh, online on our website. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye now.